Hello, awesomers. It's me, your old buddy, Steve Simonson, and I've got a special guest today. It's Stephen Pope. Say hi, Stephen. Hey, Steve. So everybody, uh, you may already know of Stephen because his reputation is uh, large and varied, uh, but he's my Amazon guy. Is that how you refer to it? Mag That's or it. my Amazon guy? How do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. I used to be just my Amazon guy. And that's kind of how the name came out. I was, I was with the wife in the laundry room and, uh, you know, I got laid off from a job and, uh, she, and so I decided I was going to start an agency on a weekend, like on a whim. And, and so we were talking in the laundry room. She's like, well, how are you going to, you know, what are you going to, what are you going to call it? And I'm, and I'm like, I don't know. And she says, how do people normally introduce you? And I've been side hustling consulting for like, you know, four or five years. And I'm like, I don't know. Nobody cares who I am. They just say, talk to my Amazon guy. And she looked at me and says, she said, that's the name. <laughs> I love it. Well, the thing is, um, I always tell people, because I've been around a long time, when they have a problem, I'm like, I got a guy, right? I'm always, I got a guy. It doesn't matter if the guy's a guy or a guy's a gal. I got a guy, right? Because you have some service, you have some solution that comes up over time. And clearly you have presented that solution to many, many of your clients. And that's, that's part of what is building your reputation. So uh, Osmers out there, we're going to do an origin story. Um, today, we're going to learn a little bit about Stephen, kind of where he came from, what he does, why he does it, and then what, how he sees the future. So uh, you, you mentioned the, the My Amazon guy, Stephen, but who's your primary target customer? Who, who are the people you serve uh, before we dive into the background? Private labelers who grow brands on Amazon. And so we're helping people start from scratch. Maybe maybe they're a manufacturer or wholesaler and they want to start on Amazon. Or we're helping those sellers that have hit that ceiling on Amazon. They don't know what to do to kind of take it to the next level. Well, okay. So that's uh, two distinct but very important audiences, everybody. If you are a manufacturer, maybe even a distributor, I don't know, that just doesn't get Amazon, it sounds like that's a potential high fit. And then, of course, the private labelers, which commonly hit these, these barriers, these obstacles, they can't get past. So you serve both those audiences, no problem. That's exactly it. And we've launched from scratch at least 250 brands. Uh, we currently serve an active 200 brands on Amazon today. We have over 175 employees worldwide in 10 different time zones. It's it's a lot of chaos, but it's Giddy organized up. chaos. Ah, well, that's the key. Uh, if you can bring order from chaos, right? If you can make that uh, madness into something special, and clearly with that many people, you've got a pretty good uh, formula going. So let's, let's just dive into a little background, Stephen, because I always find that this is instructive, right? You've already uh, hinted at, you know, getting laid off and starting your own agency, but uh, where, where does the very beginning of you, where were you born? What, what uh, city, country, state, wherever? So I was born in Medford, Oregon, uh, but I only lived there a week. Then a family moved down to Atlanta. My father was a weatherman and uh, it's kind of <laughs> like, it's kind of like being an army brat. Uh, so he works in the guild and, and we moved all over the country. I've lived in the four corners of the country, if you will. Uh, and, uh, I've been, you know, at Georgia, Wisconsin, Utah, Oregon, you name it, uh, met my wife in Maryland. So I've, I've lived literally everywhere in the States. That's crazy. So I am an army brat. I can identify very easily with that. I didn't realize that the weatherman industry was a similar thing, but it does make sense because they do seem to cycle through on, you know, every couple of years, there's a, a different weather person. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is because the markets, the larger they get, the more they pay, right? And so like, like, like an Amazon guy like me, uh, you, you could work anywhere in the world. And, and as long as you're doing well online, you get paid the same no matter where you're located uh, if you do your job, right? But in, in, in the TD market, uh, a little bit different. It's more of a guild. Uh, you have to work your way up. So I actually became a television reporter myself straight out of college. I've kind of followed my father's footsteps a little bit and coattailed a tiny bit. And, and I did that for two years in Idaho um, in, in 08. And that was when uh, that was when the big crash hit and TV was hit super hard. I was literally the last reporter hired at KIDK in, in Idaho Falls. And uh, the week that I left that, um, they actually sold to their competitor. Uh, Channel 3 sold to Channel 8 News over in Idaho Falls. Crazy. Uh, so, so it's, you know, it's very different being in the elevator on the way down in that industry versus when I made it into e-commerce and Amazon being in the elevator on the way up, right? It is uh, quite a contrast. And uh, by the way, uh, having family in Idaho Falls and I was born in Pocatello, I definitely uh, understand that little uh, sector of the world uh, to some degree. So uh, how about any, you mentioned your, your, your dad was in the weather business. Did your mom do anything professionally or 
stay at home. What was her role? More of a stay at home mom. She, you know, she did like the PTA thing, uh, PTA president multiple times at the high school and elementary schools kind of thing. Um, so it was really nice to have that family support. Um, my father worked nights because uh, because in television. So it was it was good to good to have a stay at home mom to help us out. Yeah, definitely understand. And how about any siblings? Anybody uh, in the family, uh, you know, in the same line of work or following your footsteps? So two brothers, uh, my older brother uh, decided to go the technical route. So he's an IT uh, systems guy or, or whatnot. Um, and uh, my, my younger brother's no longer with us, but I'm sure he would have followed my older brother's footsteps. He would have been in IT as well. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I definitely, uh, I've got a number of siblings myself and, and they kind of tend to vector, you know, here and there, but I do have a couple in the, the tech business. So you mentioned university. Uh, what was that experience like? Uh, did you enjoy that? Well, it depends. Uh, I went to college to be a television reporter, got a degree in communications. Uh, I, I really liked to do something different every day, which is why I became a television reporter. But the, you know, I'll be honest, if I went back to college, instead of trying to, like, I, I, did, I paid for college with debate. Um, so I was a collegiate debater, went all over the country and debated. And my claim to fame is I beat Harvard's B team in a national tournament, like, like top end national tournament beat Harvard's B team in a tournament. And that's cool. Uh, you, you know, and it's, and, and it's like, Hey, you know, let's, let's argue about corn subsidies. You're after your neck go, right? Like that was what it was like. And I'll be honest, if I went back to college, I would instead learn how to persuade mm. because I could win an argument right now with you. Steve, you pick the topic, you say after neck, I could go and I would win, but I don't think I would convince you or anybody listening that I was right. Right. Or persuade them to change behavior or persuade them to, you know, buy a contract with my Amazon guy, right? Like none of those things would happen. So if I had to go back to college, I would definitely go back to learn the art of persuasion. Yeah. That's um, an interesting but, distinction you make between persuasion and just kind of beating the opponent into, all right, fine. I'm tired of talking to you. Uh, and listen, I, I, I think debate is a good skill because it requires critical thinking. It requires analysis. It requires ca point counterpoint, but the art of persuasion uh, is uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, I'm curious, how did you, you know, how did, was there any specific point that you, you realized, oh gosh, debating or arguing is one thing, but persuasion is, is uh, more valuable to me in the long run. I, I mean, that, that took a lot of maturity, right? So I'm a very driven individual and I'm super introverted. So like, we're talking like 99 percentile drive and 97 percentile introversion. And, I, and I'm basing those exact percentages off my own culture index survey. And, and so very polarized, highly deductive individual. Um, and I don't care what people think about me. I don't seek or need social needs or attention. Um, and I'm so driven, I'm going to go get whatever I want. And I'm going to make it happen faster than anybody. So I'm a, I'm a basically I'm a hummingbird, and I'm going to get all the nectar from every single flower, no matter what it takes. So so with that in mind, I'm very full of myself, right? Like, and, and I'm, I'm recognizing that as a problem. Uh, and, and so there's some advantages and some disadvantages to my own personality, right? So the advantages is I can grow anything very, very fast. The disadvantages is once you grow something, you have to maintain it, right? Sure. And so in my early career, I worked for many failed startups. I always got hired into these things because I would crush the interview and I would go in and I actually do what I said I could do. Um, but then the problem was at these, uh, at these startups, I would just, I would say, Hey, we need to do these 17 things. And they're like, uh, Steven, we can't, we can't do 17 things. And I'm like, well, that's what we need to do. You got to do these 17 things. One, two, three, four, let's go. And they'd be like, well, maybe we could do one or two of those. And I'm like, no, that's not going to cut it. We got to do all 17 of these things. And, and, and the problem was, is that I would try and like, say, let's go do 17 things at the same time simultaneously. And, and the startups could never do it. Like they, they could never pull that off. Right. So I sold everything from women's plus size clothing, kitchen equipment, uh, you know, uh, gold and silver coins. I, I worked for the Brits. I worked for the French, uh, you know, I've, 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 even the Germans, uh, like full-time role with company ownership in those countries. And, and so like I had to mature through my corporate career uh, this is post reporter. I know I jumped around sure. a bunch. No, no, that's uh, quite right. Yeah. You're on, you're on track. So, so this is post reporter. I did a decade corporate side, four failed startups in a row, basically. And the companies couldn't keep up with me and the companies wouldn't listen to me, even though I was the right, I was right. And I was in the right seat telling them to do the right things. And I would show the right data. 
They just wouldn't do it. They wouldn't adopt it. They wouldn't, um, they thought I was crazy, right? <laughs> like, um, and so like, as just one example of why one of those failed startups failed, it was because the Brits bought a $5 million warehouse in Baltimore, Maryland. They had no freaking idea how big the United States were from a logistics standpoint. They, they didn't update their marketing material and they started sending out, uh, you know, catalogs with, uh, you're going to buy a rubbish bin from the Brits here. And they didn't price <laughs> compare. They did zero competitor research, right? Like, like they looked at it. They didn't look at how any other competitor was marketing. They, they were overpriced and they were selling business restaurant equipment. They were a $200 million business per year. Number one in the United Kingdom. They were very full of themselves. Um, and they thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just buy a big warehouse and print catalogs and we'll make lots of money. And, and their product was terrible, right? Like they were shipping over plastic forks that like, if you put it in yogurt would bend. That's how like flimsy it <laughs> wow. was. Like, That's yeah. not ideal. Yeah. And so I was like, this product is terrible. Nonetheless, this was during the time that like uh, Amazon beta advertising came out and I was getting rice cooker clicks at two cents a click on Amazon. Wow. So, so I was actually crushing it at the time. Like, uh, you know, 2000 SKU catalog, uh, they just, Amazon was just, just crushing it. Like multi, multi hundred thousand dollar growth per month, like just absolutely took off. I did. Ex I, I was having lots of fun. And then they, they just, they just lost their nerve and they're like, uh, we don't want to build another warehouse in the West coast and, and in the middle of the country. And we can't do two day prime. And, uh, we can't really ship our stuff into FBA and, um, you know, all these things, they made excuse after excuse. And I'm like, well, I gave you the right information. You just don't want to do it. And then they folded. They just, they just, they just cut tail and left. So, so I had this career where I went from one failed startup to another, and every single time I got a pay raise of at least 25%. I was never unemployed for more than like a week. Uh, and it was just an accelerated career. I really enjoyed it. Every single place I went, my boss would quit in the first six weeks, four out of five times this happened, not even kidding. Hmm. Um, and then I would take their job over and, and make it work. It never did. Uh, crazy, crazy startup lands. So at some point when I finally got laid off from a lighting company, that's when I made my Amazon guy. And this was, this is about four years ago. Uh, and now my own craziness is my own craziness, right? So like all of the problems that I create, I have to now solve and I've never been busier in my life. So for those, uh, for those entrepreneurs out there where you're like bored out of your mind and your desk jobs, just wait, once you start doing this for yourself, you'll create all of your own problems. Yeah, the uh, there's no boss is worse than you. Uh, you know, I, I find myself to be the, the you know the highest expector of high throughput. I find myself to be the the least patient uh, boss. I haven't had a boss since I was probably eighteen, I suppose. But uh, so the, on that defining moment, it sounds like the lighting company says you're you're out, or they fold it, or whatever, and then you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm starting my own gig. The laundry room lightning bolt of my Amazon guy comes up. What was the, the next step you took to make that, that new vision come to life? Quick, quick anecdote. You used the mm. word impatience. That, that was one of the core values of my Amazon guy last year. And, and so uh, obviously it has a negative connotation, right? Um, I just rebranded that to eagerness. And, and so one of the things that we hire for, and we have 175 people that work for us, we're constantly hiring. Uh, and, and small plug, if you need a job, send your resume over to jobs at my Amazon guy .com. Um, and, 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 and we just updated that to eagerness and we're constantly learning and evolving how to adopt the culture. All right. So Steve, you asked about like, what was the next step? So the next step was I had to, I, I had to get a contract, right? You get, you, you start your own company. The first thing you need is a customer, right? Sure. So, yeah. so I made a post on LinkedIn. I said, Hey, I'm going to do some consulting. Uh, I need, I need a, I need a client. I had, I had eight or so, so like side hustle consultants, but, but these were like $2,000 project-based quotes that weren't ongoing relationships, right? Sure. And so I needed, to, I needed to get reoccurring income. So I made a LinkedIn post and within 48 hours, I signed my first client. And that first client is FitLife Brands. Four years later, they're still with me. Nice. Um, I took them, uh, I can't reveal their numbers publicly because they are a publicly traded company. But suffice it to say, I paid for myself within 60 days. They've been super happy and they continue to grow. These are the guys that sell the number one energy pill on the internet called Energize. They have PMD, NDS, and many, and Isotor and many other supplement brands, 100 plus SKU brands and Walmarts and Walgreens, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so I, I land this deal in the first 48 hours from a LinkedIn post. 
And, and so I was like, cool. All right. I feel good about this. I got a, th- I got three months of severance, uh, for, for my, my lights online, uh, layoff. And, and so, you know, I just started an agency in under 48 hours just happened. So I get into the work and I start doing the catalog work. Right. And, and what most people don't realize about selling on Amazon is that it's extraordinarily difficult. It's running an entire business behind the scenes, right? It's not public. People don't get it. And, and to do catalog work, catalog work is super painful, painstaking, and has a lot of challenges, right? There's listing yanks. Your product just gets pulled down. Amazon shoots first and asks question list, questions later. And if you submit data, but somebody else submits data that permutates it together, and what shows up on the front end may not be what you submitted on the back end, right? Because Amazon solved for something that no other platform had done before. They had curated a marketplace. So right. if you sold on eBay, right? Uh, you ever sold something on eBay, Steve? Sure, sure. What was, the, what was the first thing you ever sold on eBay? Do you remember? Oh, gosh, that would have been many, many years ago. Um, probably an old computer or something from the office. So the first item I ever sold on, on eBay was a Magic the Gathering trading card. Mm-hmm. So for the nerds out there, you, you know, you're perking up right now. Uh, and it was a Sliver Queen from the Stronghold Edition. And I sold it for 20 bucks. I was 12 years old and I, and I put it in a mailer and I sent it out. Um, and so that was my first time selling something online. Growing up, I had sold all kinds of things. I became a chess teacher in junior high and high school. I taught in over 200 elementary schools in Utah, not an exaggeration. And, and I had, you know, hundreds of different private students over the years. And so like I bought chess sets and I was selling them uh, to my own students and I figured out the game of markup. And so like, like Gary Vee always talks about how if you get a job in a gas station or a retail space, how, how like your entrepreneur mind just like races, like you see it in real time. And so as a kid, that was me, but I didn't realize that I could do that full time as a kid. Nobody told me this, right? Like I didn't realize it. And I thought, oh, I got to go to school. And I got to get a corporate job. Like that, that, that was what society fed me. Sure. So, so it took a long time for me to realize this. There's a very famous story that I'm going to butcher about um, a crew and maybe you've read it. Let me know. Insert whenever uh, where a crew lands in the new world. And, and they they had a problem where people were like, ah, this new world, you know, it's it's not very sexy. It's hard. I got to cut down lumber. I got to fight the Indians. I, you know, I got to build stuff and hunt deer and whatever else. And so the leader um, called everybody together on the beach and he said, all right, guys, we're staying put. And then he burned his freaking ships down so that everybody knew that you couldn't go back to the old world. Yeah, there's no exit plan. It's just we're, we're hunkering down, get with it and uh, like it. One of my mentors is Harry Joyner. He's the top uh, e-commerce recruiter in the country. Yeah. Uh, he happens to be local to me in, in the Atlanta area. Uh, he placed me at, at four gigs. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, Harry, it's your fault. I worked at those field startups. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, but, Harry is super well known, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great that Stephen has a personal report with him, but you know, I've known about Harry and probably communicated with Harry over the last 15, 20 years frequently because he is the number one e-com recruiter uh, out so, there. So there's only three people that have been placed by Harry Joyner four times. I'm one of them. So I hold the record. Nice. And, and so we're actually, we're actually besties. Uh, uh, and so we talk all the time, but, but anyway, uh, so, so I actually lost. Okay. So, so the burn the ship story, right? right. I, I did not embrace the agency for a solid six months. And, and Harry gave me the burn the ship speech, not once, not twice, but three times. Well, good. It's it's nice to know that things stick after three with Steven. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) And so like, I was like, I don't know, Harry, go find me, go find me a gig. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, I don't really want to move the family, but you know, I'll do it. I've, you know, I've done this before, whatever. And so, um, by, by month, like four or three of starting the agency, I had revenue of 35,000 a month Impressive. and I, and, and, and I still hadn't burned my ships. Hmm. <laughs> like I still hadn't burned them. And it took me six months to really just be like, okay, I burned my ships. I'm done. I, this is my life. Now I've started an agency. Um, and when I was doing the hard work for fit life, working on their catalog it was some of the hardest grueling work I'd ever done to that stage in my career. 
And, and it worked, it was successful, but it was super hard. It was grilling. I was in Excel files. I was doing template uploads into seller central, super technical work. Right. I hated it. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> it was the complete, complete opposite of what I signed up for, which is why I couldn't burn my ships. I was like, I freaking hate this stuff. I don't want to work in Excel files. I want to go sell. Right. So I had to correct that. And the way I corrected that was I hired an assistant. So three weeks later, this is three weeks after starting the agency, I, I hired my first assistant. Her name was Marley Hillam, fantastic uh, girl, you know, college bound, sweetheart, couldn't have had a better first hire. So I had her work in my house with me. Uh, we, we moved the bed out of the guest room and we set up a second office and off to the races we were. And I gave her the catalog work. And then I started getting on the phone and selling contracts. Well, the problem with that was, is I sold eight contracts very quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're really good so, at it. Yeah. So I'm really good at sales. So I had to hire a second employee, uh, Jacob Privet. And I'm just really lucky that I hired really good people to begin with. Um, and, and these were people that had no e-commerce background. Uh, and uh, Jacob Privet now runs his own agency. And it's, you know, it's like, it's like a third the size of my Amazon guy. So he's doing really, really well for himself. And he has all of his own, own employees. And so we, we you know. Um, so it's really cool that my origin story created another origin story. And I was, I was looking on the other day on LinkedIn, um, this executive over in Amazon Europe, and he's like talking about how many jobs they made in Europe. It was like 200,000. And I said, you can add another 175 to your figure. Thank you, Amazon. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have 175 jobs at my Amazon guy. And, and so we had to hire a ton of people. So, it's, so when I first started out, I didn't want to start an agency. It just happened. And today I feel like I don't run an agency. I run an HR company. And here's where I'm going to tie in the persuasion comment. Mm -hmm. Today, it's no longer about debating and winning. And now it's about culture and people. I no longer run an agency. I run a human resources company. I run an HR company. And we had to hire a tremendous amount of people along the way to make that happen. So I know I just rambled a lot, Steve. I don't know which part you are more. Well, I'm, I think in. it's all so, so salient and informative. So there's a couple takeaways that I had. You're, you're going back to Harry and you're like, Harry, uh, we already got the record tied up at four. I'm looking to break it. I want to be your number five placement. Uh, never before happened. And Harry sees what you're doing. Maybe even is like, you know, it's time to kick the bird out of the nest. And he's like, no, lean in. And that you have some moment of clarity, which is I don't have to stay in the tactical hell that is uh, for me as well, by the way, spreadsheets and, and database, you know, uploads that are uh, that detail work is something that just kills my soul. Maybe yours, too. So then you started to hire and you've learned now the most important lesson, which I think entrepreneurs often fail to learn, which is the secret to scale is actually people. Uh, everybody thinks it's kind of automation, but people are the secret. Yes. People, process, or systems, and product. And people is the hardest freaking one. <laughs> Completely agree. Yeah. So as you started hiring, um, you know, are there any big takeaways or any big lessons that, and by the way, your, your, your um, timeline of maturity is also quite similar to my own, right? Which is, you know, I'm young and brash and impatient. We, we also marketize internally in our values that we act with urgency, which is the same as saying Steve's impatient, go fast. Uh, it is. And the, the whole point is that we want people who, who can live in that kind of uh, environment. And you must have certain lessons you've taken away with all the hires you've made so far. Everything that we've done is to build a super transparent um, offering. I actually, right before we shot this, I, I did an interview and, and I said, what was the reason why you reached out to talk to me? And he said, it's, it's your transparency. He says, you know who you're working for. He tells you everything that he's up to making this. He's talking about me. And I make LinkedIn posts every day about like our accomplishments and what we're working on as an agency. I just integrated HubSpot. Holy crap. That was a pain in the ass. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you know uh, and, and I, I, you know, today I made a LinkedIn post about how we have 150 act 150,000 active Asana tasks as a project management software. Right. And so like, I, I like literally talk about all these things super openly and people are like, why do you give away all your trade secrets? Aren't you worried? Everybody's going to rip you off. And I'm like, have at it guys. I know it's really hard and I know you're not going to be able to mimic or copy me, but have at it. I'll get like, it's not me against you. 
other Amazon agency. It's you and me against Amazon, right? That's like right. Mr. Jeff Bezos wants to get off the rock and, and he's going to take and take and take all our resources, right? I bite the hand that feeds me. Can you tell? Um, <laughs> well, believe me, he ain't feeding you voluntarily. The minute he can excess out, he will. Um, but I, I love the fact that you have identified a, a very real, I don't know, sense of reality, which is, I don't know how real reality fits in, but the, the, the focus that I've always found is that what we do is hard and execution is everything. Ideas are almost worthless. Uh, everybody's got ideas. If you can't execute, you're not going anywhere. True? That's completely true. I think that's the difference between uh, the drive to go get stuff done or the ingenuity to create something, right? Well, um, there's a reason really highly ingenuous people uh, end up being creative. The question is, is what do they do with that creativity, right? Do they... Do they go into the art and draw the most creative thing ever? Or do they create a process and a system and attract people and build an empire, right? Like very, very different skill set. Uh, so, so one of the things I learned along the way was I had to, I had to attract talent nonstop because I, I, I was a better marketer than I was an operator. And if, you're, if your marketing outpaces your operations, it's going to be very, very uh, difficult for your operations team. <laughs> And so we had to create nonstop SOPs. Um, I, had, I had two gentlemen that exited other competitor agencies and started with me in the last 48 hours. We don't actively poach from any other agency. They come to us, which is a great place to be at. Um, but, but anyway, uh, so I was talking to one of them and, and, and I said, how are things going? And, he's, and, and, and I couldn't even like finish my sentence. He's like, holy crap, I can't believe how much process and, and systems you've put into place. My day one like completely like structured. I know exactly where to go to do this. I know how to do that. And I'm like, I, I, I've been wishing this structure existed my entire career. Where has it been? And I said, it's been at my Amazon guy, but um, you have to have all of these systems built, right? There's a reason most agencies top out at 40 clients. They can't go more than 40. And it's it, like, I, I, like, I'm telling you, like I've talked to hundreds of agencies. They all top out at 40 or they're in the hundreds, but there's like no in between right? 40 accounts can be managed by one account director, two account managers, maybe three, and a support staff of eight Amazon specialists or, or, or specialists for whatever agency you're working at. And then and an additional like eight specialists that hyper-focus in their own thing, like SEO, PPC design, and catalog management, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the hub of a 40 account agency. They, they can never hire their second account director. That's where they get, that's where they get, they, they mess up. Right. Like, how do you create a husk around that entire division or department? And so, like, we figured out the math very early on that there was there was a sustainability. Right. So if we have 200 accounts, we know we need five account directors. We know we need X number of account managers, number of Amazon specialists, number of designers, PBC specialists all the way down. And we built this structure and we know exactly how to forecast. If we add 10 more accounts, we need this number of people. We have the formula figured out. That's the difference between a good company and a great company. And, and, and we, we want to be a great company. Yeah. I, so first of all, those, this is the, the thing that I really enjoy about you breaking this down is, first of all, the systems of process really do create the only sense of order from chaos, right? Uh, chaos it happens because our entrepreneur brains are like, I got a bunch of ideas and I want to go fast. And I am really good at convincing other people that my ideas are good, right? Uh, Self-assurance is something you're going to be very high in, which is why you, A, are confident in your own right, and B, you can convince other people of that same confidence. So bringing in things and creating more chaos is easy. Uh, my staff often calls them hand grenades, right? I, I come in and <laughs> drop off hand grenades, shut the door and like, good luck to you. Um, Seagull management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, but over time you realize, no, we can't, we have to structure, we have to predict, right. And everything has a formula, everything has a pattern. And, and I salute you for knowing the pattern of, you know, X number of accounts equals X number of hires onboarding. You know, uh, we also are huge believers in task management systems and process. And that's, you know, over the course of time, you know, I've been able to grow a number of companies you know, uh, to, let's just say mid-sized companies uh, with, you know, often hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees. Uh, and, but it all comes back to that backbone of systems process and uh, somebody who will use their brain and, and execute with excellence. That's, that's our mission. So 
Um, so th th a big lesson to you is, seems to be that systems, process, ratios, um, and HR are really what matter to making your company grow. Is that fair? Uh, completely fair. If you want to yeah. be a great company, you need a home run on all three. If you want to be a good company, you got to be really great at one of them and passing on the other. C's get degrees on the other two. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, greatness is, uh, elusive in the same way that, you know, people, uh, can't like I I've for years said, I'll tell you exactly how we've built, you know, a hundred million dollar e-commerce business. And if you can do it, kudos, but I've told, you know, a thousand people that, and I only know of maybe three who've been able to do it right. Because execution is difficult. So, um, how about, um, was there ever a time, let's say after you started my Amazon guy, you burned the boats, you're, you're committed. Now, was there ever a time where you wanted to give up? You know, did you ever hit any sort of uh, hard wall or, or has it all just been smooth sailing? So because I'm full of myself and I feel like I could build the system and manage it and do everything myself, here's the most critical mistake I made while trying to build my Amazon guy. I didn't hire enough leaders. So I don't have a stack of, I don't have a C-suite of stack filled with people, right? 2021, January was the first time I hired a chief. I hired a chief technology officer with an MIT master's degree in engineering and technical, right? I'm building a software now. I want to become a SaaS company. Every, every agency ever wants to be a SaaS company. Every SaaS company ever wants to start an agency. It's a thing. Um, I'm going to do both. I also have my own product businesses. I, you know, I have a successful million dollar brand called Monster and Age of Sage. I'm launching a, um, a, a holster company called Holstit. We already have like a multi-million dollar contract that might, might be signed soon. Uh, and so there, there's a bunch of cool things that are going on. Uh, and, and so like my personal motto, I happen to be wearing my personal motto right now. And it is live long and prosper. It's a picture of Spock. You can't see the whole thing. <laughs> I, I can see it now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, I love it. And, and, and my wife actually made me rebrand this. I used to just say prosperity in all things. And she says, nobody understands what that means. So, so it's live long and prosper now, which means every component of my life, the businesses and the family all must be prosperous. So I have four kids, six and under. I, I work from home and I spend as much time as I can being a great dad too. So, and I, and I'm religious and I attend church. And, and so like every single component of my life from a spiritual, physical family business, all of them must be prosperous. It's something I demand of myself. Uh, and so all of those buckets must be filled. But the mistake that I made was I didn't hire enough leaders. And so that's what I fixed in 2021. And I wanted it to not be single threaded at, at the scale that I'm operating on right now, it would be impossible for me to pull it all off without having a leadership team. And I'm so proud to say that, in, that we succeeded in this past year, building out that leadership team to take some of that stress and pressure off of me. So now I can wear the hat that I want to wear, which is the marketing hat, going back to my roots, right? And going out and doing podcasts and creating video content. I've made over 900 videos where I share all of my trade secrets on YouTube about how to sell everything on Amazon, how to grow sales, how to problem solve this, how to troubleshoot that. And, and that's what I love doing. But I had to build that leadership team to overcome that. And, and that's really where I was like, holy crap, what do we build? How do I run this? Right? Like the maintenance and the scale. That's, that's what really made me want to quit. Yeah, I feel you. Um, I've, uh, I'm lucky enough to have been in business a long time. And um, now when I, when I start a company or fund a company, I will generally start with the leader who hires the other uh, people because I don't want to have that day-to-day -day responsibility. And it's a really important lesson. It's also not easy to execute. So kudos to you for recognizing it and executing on it. Um, uh, rich, rich dad, rich, rich dad, poor dad, quad four is what you're describing for, in my opinion, right? Like there's a difference between being the business manager or the business owner right? You hire the guy to be the business manager. Yeah, for sure. I, I've read Rich Dad, but I, I'm not familiar with the quad four lingo. But, you know, you, you are either working on the business or in the business, use the e-myth uh, vernacular. Yes. And, um, and th the honest truth is, if you're working in the business, you have a job. If you're working on the business, you own a company, right? And that's, that's what we all that's need to the, evolve to. Um, how about uh, any best day of your professional life? Now that you've got this thing going, was there any day where you just took a minute and said, Hey, I'm taking a victory lap today. This was a pretty good day. I, I almost, I, I almost say it. it's like almost a daily feeling because we keep growing and we keep doing it. Just, just the other day. Um, one of my 
you know, newly instituted leaders from 2021 came out with an initiative and didn't propose it to me. He just got it done. And that, that moment felt so dang good because it was like, Hey, the business is now to the point where it can start to run itself. And I could not be more proud. It's almost like, you know, so it's, it's like we've exited the startup phase. We're no longer a startup, right? Like it, it's like into seeing your kid take its first steps or, uh, you know, or a teenager leaving the house for the first time. It's like all of those feelings in one. And so like that, that makes me so proud because it's like something that you've created. It's an entity. It's an act. It's got a living and breathing thing. And now it can take care of itself. You're no longer changing diapers. Oh, it is uh, a really good example, by the way. Uh, and I, I recommend all entrepreneurs out there, you know, to recognize what phase your business is in. If it's in infancy or toddler mode, you're doing everything. But as it starts to grow, you've got to you've got to pull back and stop. In my opinion, stop doing task management and get into result management. Right? You give the leaders. Here's the result we're looking for. Do we all agree? We shake hands. Let's go get it done. Um, and, and then let them deal with the tactics of it instead of you having to write the SOP for everything. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Stephen? I think, I think that's great. You know, I'll, I'll plug a book. I keep this on my desk. It's called Traction. Sure. And, and I'm sure you've read that one. Gino. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I'm constantly thinking about like, which, which in, the, in, in the case of, of traction, there's six quads, right? I don't know what the equivalent quad name for that is, but, um, and so I'm constantly like rotating, like, which of those six things am I going to be working on this quarter? What's my rock, right? And, and so we have 175 employees that are remote in time, 10 time zones around the world, right? If, if I was just managing activity levels, that'd be a totally different result versus, hey, go get it done, cross, cross the finish line. One of the core values that I uh, expired or retired was get uh, was uh, go the extra mile, and and so like how how people felt like go the extra mile was was like hey don't just check the box make new boxes or stay late and work hard and that wasn't what I was going for, so I retired that and I instigated get on base, and this is straight up from the athletics uh, you know Brad Pitt storyline. This is a great clip. Go look it up. Uh, Brad Pitt is talking. He's got Jonah Hill as his quant, uh, and it's the, the movie's called Moneyball. Moneyball. And and so like, how did the athletic A's, you know, make to the playoffs, win twenty games in a row, and they did it by getting everything down to one result: get on base. They recreated, um, you know, one superstar with three dudes that were, you know, equivalent somehow. And, and then that those guys were just really freaking good at that one result, get on base. So that's actually a new uh, core value for, for my Amazon guys, get on base. And, and that's when I, I found myself like calling people and I was like, why isn't this done? Just freaking get on base. Just get on base. I don't care if you swing the bat and get a home run or not. I just want you to get on base. The next guy, he can get an RBI, right? Like he can, he can get you to the home plate, just start and go get on base. I love it. Uh, I can't wait to see how the uh, baseball analogy works in 10 different time zones, uh, <laughs> knowing that baseball is not part of their uh, I, I swapped out. I swapped out go the extra mile, an yeah. American thing, for get on base, the American sport. <laughs> Uh, so, so mind you, yeah, I was very cognizant of that. When I made the announcement, I actually brought that up. <laughs> That's good. Well, the, the truth is people just need a rallying cry. They need to understand what the leadership is, is asking for. And values, you've mentioned this word a number of times, core values, core values, core values. But that is often missing uh, uh, the lack of articulation of core values, the lack of having core values, right? You probably have them, but you may not be enforcing them or you're like, ah, well, he did the best he could. It's like, well, is that part of your core value, right? And, and I really do suggest people map that out. And it starts for us with just statements like, what do you believe, right? I believe in doing the right thing, right? I believe in the golden rule. I believe in, you know, and you just start saying what you believe and that's how you suss out your core values. And then I cannot stress it enough. Stephen has mentioned this multiple times, the word culture. And by the way, for the entrepreneurs who have five people and it's not quite working the way you thought and you think you're the smartest and nobody can ever be as good as you. And, you know, there's this trough of sorrow that comes in when you first hire people. It's more work for you. It's harder. 
it's not as easy as it used to be. And you still, of course, know more about the business. So you go through this trough of sorrow before the, the productivity increases. And I just encourage you, get the values down, understand culture, and and make it something that people can rally behind. Stephen, am I a, a nut job or what, what's your thoughts? I, I completely agree. Um, and you have to be a nut job to be an entrepreneur. Let's be clear, right? Sure. Like, yeah. You have to, I mean, like, uh, uh, there's a reason why most of entrepreneurs have the same brain scans that serial killers have. Like, we're yeah. all crazy, right? Yeah, it's uh, but, a razor's edge over here, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but society benefits from this, like, because we are just obsessing over these details and how to like grow, like and add value to society. We're solving problems. This is all beneficial. Um, and, and so like, and, and keep in mind guys, like these core values that we, I've, I've definitely talked too much about, um, they, they can update that. Right? You heard me talk about how I retired two right. of my core values just in the last 30 days. And so you're not marrying yourself to this, your core values that you need when you have five employees is definitely not going to be the same core values you're going to want. Not all five of them anyway, when you hit 50 employees or 100 employees. So, so today our core values are growth, eagerness, strategic communication, tech savvy, and get on base. There you go. I think those are really well said. And again, there are, there are different parts of your, your evolution at running a company and yourself as uh, an entrepreneur. Then we all just have to learn and do our best as we go. And the fact that people listen to this, the fact that people watch your podcasts and, and YouTubes and the rest of it, uh, these are all examples of people trying to learn more and get better. So kudos to you on sharing. Uh, as we're running against the clock, I'll give you the last uh, bit here to just give us a crystal ball prediction. What's, what's going to happen over the next five years within the Amazon space or e-commerce at large, whatever you care to, to wager on? What, what do you see happening in five years or over so the next five so I want to take my own businesses and make them into a $50 million per year business. So that's my own personal prediction. I'm trying to exercise extreme ownership to make that personal goal happen. In terms of Amazon, I think Amazon will continue to be the number one main economic dominator for the next five years. I thought Walmart would catch up to them. They bought Jet. They couldn't integrate it. Their tech sucks. I don't know if you've ever done Walmart pickup for grocery. What an awful, awful experience. Hmm. Go do it at Target, though. And Target's like magical, just complete magic, right? So I, I have a sneaking suspicion that if there's ever a sleeper agent that's going to come take out Amazon, it's going to be Target, not Walmart. And, and Amazon and Shopify are definitely butting heads right now. Um, I do think that Shopify might have a thing or two to say about who's going to be the next uh, you know, four horsemen, if you will, uh, coming in the next decade. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Amazon comes out with its own Shopify competitor in the next 90 days. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard rumors, uh, nothing officiated, but I pretty sure it's going to happen. Um, and so I think that we're going to see Walmart, I'm sorry, we're going to see Amazon continue to try and get vertical control. They bought all the boats. They're trying to get, you know, they're trying to fix the port problems because the government F's it up. And so that's what happens. Businesses come in and try and fix the governmental mess. And I think all of these things are going to happen here in the next few years. Yeah. Very salient predictions. Uh, I definitely uh, agree with uh, you know a, a bunch of what you said, and and I I think that there is a big you know kind of uh, bright future not just on the Amazon platform but in in some of these other econ platforms. But you really have to just measure your your ROI as you go, right? Everybody can't be everywhere because it's just you you don't have enough uh, resources to do it. Nobody does. Uh, but uh, you know unless you own it all. Yeah, like Amazon does. <laughs> yeah, well, Amazon, yeah, yeah, they, the have, they have really, you know, back in 2000, when there's very little shot of them ever making money, they're like, we don't intend to make money, we intend to build, right? And then that went on for years and years and years and years, until they built everything. And then it's like, oh, now we'll make money. And that, and now they do. Uh, so it's, it's uh, quite a uh, testament to their, their long term vision and patience, honestly. They're entering the maturity phase. For sure. So any, uh, any last words of wisdom, Stephen, uh, for the awesomers out there? I appreciate the time so far, but uh, any pearls that you care to leave behind? Just get on base. You got to get started, guys. Any entrepreneur out there, if you need inspiration, you're not an entrepreneur. You got to just go do it, right? <laughs> like, like any entrepreneur out there looking for the inspiration to go get started, if you need that, you're not an entrepreneur. Go back to your desk job. But for those out there that are doing it and they just want to be told that, hey, continue doing it and it's going to lead somewhere, you guys are going to, you guys are going to succeed. You're going to do it. 
You just have to exercise extreme ownership of your own outcomes. So, Steve, thanks for having me on the podcast. This is great. I love it. Stephen, well done you. Uh, Awesomers, we'll be back next time. Uh, but don't forget, uh, you know, go ahead and like this and share it. And, uh, and if you're a private label seller or brand, for that matter, and you need an agency to step in and help you get past some things, why not take a look at my Amazon guy? By the way, there's never a sponsor on here. We don't do sponsors. We don't do things. He's Steven and I just uh, have a chance to catch up and get to know you. And uh, I definitely, I like the spirit. I like the cut of your jib, sir. So there we go. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. We'll, thank, we'll talk thank to you, you soon. Thank, we'll thank talk you. to you soon. Thank, we'll talk to you soon. We'll talk to you soon. We'll talk to you soon.